By the late 1990s, Sun Microsystem was a giant of the tech world. With a market cap north of $150 billion, it stood among Silicon Valley's elite. Sun had pioneered the radical idea that computers shouldn't be isolated boxes, but interconnected machines sharing power and information. It built the hardware, the operating systems, the processors, and even the programming languages to make the vision real. For a moment, it seemed like Sun had cracked the code for the future of computers but it would all come crashing down, first falling victim to Microsoft's ruthless tactics in the 90s, then being outflanked and outcompeted by Linux and the open source movement, and the final nail in the coffin would be literal banishment to hell when it was acquired by Oracle for less than a tenth of its once meteoric peak value. This is the story of Sun Microsystems, how a Silicon Valley legend that pioneered the modern tech industry flew too close to the sun and got burned. If you want to understand the story of Sun Microsystems, you have to start with one man, Andreas Bechtelsheim. After studying at the University of Technology in Munich, Andreas earned a scholarship to Stanford University in the late 1970s. There, he would find himself surrounded by the growing personal computer revolution and noticed a gap in the industry. At the time, workstations for engineers and scientists were incredibly expensive and the cheaper ones were far too underpowered to be used in highly technical fields. Andreas decided to build something to address this gap in the market. While studying at Stanford, he designed a powerful networked workstation based on off-the-shelf components but with the speed and capability of a much more expensive machine. Around this time, Andreas also worked as a consultant for Xerox's legendary Palo Alto Research Center, the birthplace of the graphical user interface, Ethernet networking, and laser printing. He saw firsthand how powerful networked computing could be if machines were not isolated, but instead connected, sharing resources seamlessly. Since Xerox had no plans to commercialize the inventions at Park, Andreas decided that he would design his own version of a powerful networked computer that would empower scientists, engineers, and researchers to do complex and collaborative work using a personal workstation. In 1981, he joined a project at Stanford that aimed to build low-cost personal workstations for computer-aided design. The workstations used the Motorola 68K chip the first commercially available 32-bit microprocessor. The workstation became known as the Sun Workstation, Sun being short for Stanford University Network. The workstation design was so compelling that it attracted attention from Stanford faculty and fellow students. But as demand for the workstation began to grow, Stanford shut down the project. Andreas immediately went out to look for companies that he could license the design to, only to be met with rejection after rejection. The big computer makers of the time either didn't understand the potential of networked workstations or saw no market for them. Instead of shelving the idea, Andreas decided he would simply start his own company that would design and sell powerful workstations. Around this time, he crossed paths with Vinod Kosler, an energetic serial entrepreneur who had been recently a part of a failed startup failing in part due to lack of sufficient hardware. When Kosler heard about Andreas and his workstations, he immediately recognized from his personal experience that there was a real need for the machines. Kosler would recruit a friend of his called Scott McKinley, a Harvard grad he had worked with on a previous startup. The final piece of the dream team would be Bill Joy. He would lead the software efforts to enable the workstation to run the Berkeley Unix operating system. Together, the four co-founded Sun Microsystems, which would officially go into business in February of 1982. Sun Microsystems had mountains of pre-orders before they did even opened for business. The Sun 1 was introduced in May 1982 as Sun's inaugural Unix workstation, featuring a 10 MHz Motorola 68K CPU, high resolution graphics, Ethernet networking, and was priced at around $8,900. Sun's most significant competition within the workstation market was Apollo. Apollo had the head start. Founded in 1980, their machines were loved by CAD engineers, had gorgeous graphics, and came wrapped in a polished, integrated software environment. Apollo had proprietary hardware, proprietary operating system, and proprietary networking. Everything was locked down, which meant if you bought an Apollo, you were living in Apollo's world, and only Apollo's world. Sun's approach was quite the opposite. Sun's workstation ran Unix. 
used industry standard networking like Ethernet and came with NFS. So sharing files across machines felt like magic. Instead of locking customers into one ecosystem, Sun embraced the idea that its workstations should play nice with everyone else's gear. Apollo, meanwhile, doubled down on its walled garden approach. For a while, it worked. They had the bigger market share through the mid 80s, but Sun kept hammering away. Faster processors, better networking, more competitive prices. By the late 80s, Sun's workstations were setting performance benchmarks and Apollo's once cutting edge proprietary operating system was starting to feel like a prison. Then came the knockout blows. The workstation market shifted toward unique standards, open networking and interoperability, all of which Sun had built into its DNA from day one. Apollo scrambled to adapt, even rolling out its own Unix variant. But by then, the tide had turned. Sun was the Unix workstation king. Apollo's growth stalled and in 1989, Hewlett Packard bought Apollo outright, later shutting it down, leaving Sun as the victor in the workstation wars of the 80s. Sun's remarkable rise was shown in its financial success. It became profitable months after it was started. In its first year of business in 1982, it generated over $8 million in revenue. By 1984, only two years in, Sun hit $39 million in revenue. By 1986, they were pulling in $240 million annually. So when Sun decided to go public in March of 1986, the timing was perfect. The IPO raised $86 million and the momentum didn't slow. By the late 80s, Sun was clocking in over half a billion dollars in annual revenue and growing at roughly 35-40% to 40 per year. Their customer base now spanned Fortune 500 companies, government research labs, universities and Wall Street trading floors. But all this growth was proving to be a bit too much for one of Sun's most important partners, Motorola, the company that supplied Sun with its microprocessors. They only had one small design team for its microprocessor unit and it was struggling to keep up. In one instance, it took them two years to sort out a memory issue with their microprocessor. It also took them two years to grow from 10 MHz CPU designs to 12 MHz. As a result, Sun began thinking of other chip vendors that they could work with, notably Intel, which had become one of the largest chip manufacturers in the world. However, when Sun tried to use Intel chips in its workstations, it didn't go well and eventually they settled on designing their own microprocessor. Their chip, the Sun Spark, would end up being much faster than the chips their competitors used. By the late 1980s, Sun Microsystems had conquered the Unix workstation market, but their ambitions were way bigger than just selling high-end engineering boxes. Sun's executives, especially Scott McNeely and Bill Joy, had their eyes on something much bolder, taking Unix beyond workstations and into the broader personal computer market. But there was a problem. Unix was a mess. Since the birth of Unix at Bell Labs in the 1970s, Unix had been forked multiple times, creating a chaotic family tree. AT&T System V branch was one lineage, while the University of California at Berkeley's BSD branch was another, and dozens of hardware vendors had hacked together their own versions, IBM, HP, DEC, Apollo, everyone was building their own flavor of Unix and they weren't exactly compatible. Sun saw this fragmentation as the enemy of growth. If Unix was even going to challenge Microsoft in the broader PC world, it needed a single unified standard, and who better to help than AT&T, the original original owner of Unix. In 1988, Sun and AT&T announced a landmark deal. AT&T would take a 20% stake in Sun Microsystems and together they'd create a unified Unix. The project promised one operating system to rule them all, capable of running on everything from workstations to future Unix powered PCs. For Sun, it was the golden ticket to escape the niche engineering market and challenge the dominance of DOS and Windows. But not everyone was cheering. The other big Unix vendors, IBM, HP, DEC and Apollo, saw the Sun at and partnership as a power grab. If Sun controlled the official Unix, everyone else risked becoming a second class citizen in their market. The backlash was fierce. In 1989, IBM and HP led a counter offensive, forming their coalition and eventually backing the Open Source Foundation, an alternative Unix initiative designed to keep Sun and at and from holding all the cards. Sun and at and responded 
started by creating their own organization, Unix International, to promote their unified version. Instead of one happy Unix family, the industry now had two competing camps. For Sun, this was a disaster. Sun's drive to unify Unix was part of its chip master plan. Sun wanted to marry its new Unix with its upcoming Spark microprocessor strategy, creating a vertically integrated ecosystem from chip to OS. But the Unix wars scared off potential partners, split the developer community and slowed adoption outside of Sun's existing customer base. Instead of a smooth expansion into the PC mass market, Sun found itself locked in a cold war with the rest of the Unix world. The division created the perfect opening for the boogeyman of 90s tech, Bill Gates. Gates had recognized Sun as a threat to Windows quite early on. In the late 80s, Microsoft hired Dave Cutler, the legendary architect of DEC's VMS operating system, to build something entirely new, a 32-bit enterprise-grade operating system that could rival Unix. The result was Windows NT. Released in 1993, unlike DOS or Windows 3.1, NT had real multi-user, multitasking chops, and a graphics user interface that looked friendlier than any Unix desktop and crucially it ran on Intel's rapidly advancing x86 chips which were getting faster and cheaper with every generation. Sun's biggest rivals IBM and HP didn't fight it, they embraced it. Both companies began releasing workstations that ran Windows NT alongside their Unix offerings. Sun on the other hand refused. Sun had positioned itself as a fully integrated systems company as opposed to just being a hardware vendor. Their machines ran Solaris. They their own flavor of Unix on Spark processors they designed themselves. The idea was full vertical integration. The operating system, the CPU, and the hardware would be optimized together for maximum performance. It was akin to the Apple model, but for high-end workstations. To Sun, adopting Windows NT would have been like inviting a fox into the henhouse. But as the 1990s rolled on, the ground began to shift. Intel's processors were getting fast enough to challenge Sun's Spark chip. At the same time, Microsoft kept improving NT, making it more stable, more scalable, and more appealing. And then came Windows 95, bringing a unified Windows ecosystem from the desktop to high-end workstations. Linux also appeared as a competitor. In the mid-1990s, Linux was still a scrappy hobbyist operating system. It wasn't polished, it wasn't officially supported by any big company, and it wasn't something Fortune 500 CTOs were betting their infrastructure on. But it had two things going for it that terrified Sun's long-term strategy. It was free and it was open source. For Sun, this was a nightmare scenario. Linux took the Unix heritage, stripped away the vendor lock-in, and ran on cheaper Intel hardware. By the late 90s, companies like Red Hat were packaging Linux into enterprise-ready distributions. Suddenly, you could get a Unix-like operating system without paying Sun a dime, and you could run it on a $3,000 PC instead of a $15,000 Sun workstation. By the late 1990s, Sun Microsystems knew the workstation glory days were fading. Windows and Intel boxes were cheaper, fast enough for most jobs, and had the momentum of Microsoft's marketing machine behind them. Linux was also posing a serious threat. Sun could see the writing on the wall, so they pivoted hard. Sun decided to move up the value chain into the server business. Their fully integrated approach to workstations translated well into the server business. A strength of Sun Solaris operating system was its symmetric multiprocessing capabilities, which allowed for the addition of 100 Spark processors to the system with minimal latency. Windows and Intel servers were limited to just 4 to 8 processors per system. From 1998 to 2000, the internet exploded, and every startup from pets.com to Yahoo who needed servers, lots of them, and not just any servers. They wanted the kind that could stay online 24-7 without crashing under the weight of millions of page requests. Sun's hardware became the default choice for serious web infrastructure. The money started to pour in. In 2000, Sun hit $18 billion in annual revenue and $2 billion in profit. They were spearheading the dream of an always-on, connected world, and for a brief, shining moment, it looked like they might own the future of the technology 
individual, but then the dot-com bubble popped. Sun's biggest customers, internet startups, started going bankrupt by the hundreds. Demands for high-end servers evaporated almost overnight. Sun's revenue plummeted and those billion dollar profits flipped into massive losses. And just as they were struggling to recover, another threat was maturing. Linux servers on community hardware. The same pitch that hurt them in workstations. Cheap, fast Intel processors running an open source operating system was now eating into their lucrative server business. Enterprises that once bought $500,000 Sun servers could now get wrecks of Linux boxes for a fraction of the cost. Linux was cheap and just good enough for most workloads and it had the backing of a growing open source movement that Sun couldn't control. The widespread adoption of Linux servers completely destroyed Sun's enterprise server business and Sun was in serious trouble. Annual revenue had fallen from $18 billion at its peak in 2000 to under 11 11 billion dollars by 2004 and profits had been replaced with losses. They tried to pivot into the relational database management software market. They bought MySQL for 1 billion dollars, the world's then most popular open source database. But the timing was brutal. The global financial crisis had just hit. Tech spending across the industry was frozen and Sun's revenues collapsed again. By 2008 to 2009, Sun was bleeding cash. They posted a 1.6 billion dollar loss in fiscal 2009 on revenues of just 11.4 billion dollars. Once a Silicon Valley powerhouse, Sun had now become a takeover target. In April 2009, IBM considered buying them but walked away. Then Oracle swooped in with a 7.4 billion dollar acquisition deal. Oracle was mainly interested in consolidating its dominance over the relational database market by adding MySQL to its portfolio and also getting control of the Java programming language. Most of Sun Sun Microsystems other products were rebranded by Oracle and the once famous name of Sun Microsystems would quietly fade from the tech world. In the end, Sun would become a cautionary tale about stubborn vision. Sun's vertical integration approach was revolutionary when their workstations ruled the market and was furthermore insanely profitable when they entered the server business at just the right time as the dot-com boom was going into full swing. But when the market began shifting first to Intel based workstations and later to Linux servers, Sun thought they knew better and remained rigid as the industry shifted around them. Eventually they would be caught out by these shifts, having to pivot into new businesses until eventually they had no more tricks up their sleeve and they would be banished to the hell that is Oracle ownership. Thank you for watching.